Thank you for having the opportunity to speak today with you about this very interesting topic, especially you remember the festivities we celebrated a couple of weeks ago regarding the 70th anniversary of the Day of Liberation. And that will be my topic today to discuss with you. Was it a really day of liberation for all Germans? Um, I thank you, Mr. Dornfried, for the introduction of my person. And maybe I'd like to add a special point why I'm very interested in that topic of history. I was born in Torgau, Torgau at the Elbe River. And maybe one of you heard that in Torgau on April 25th, 1945, the Allies, Soviet and American soldiers, linked up first time at the end of World War II. So the East and West Front in Europe came together first time in Torgau. And at that time, the spirit of the Elbe was born the idea of peace, of freedom, but I will go into it deeper later. Let me start with a quote from a refugee uh, from, the, from Prussia, from East Prussia. He said in a, in a, couple, week, or a couple of weeks ago in the newspaper Idea, which is a Christian magazine, magazine, I'm grateful for the fact that Hitler lost the war and I do not have to live in a country under Nazi rule. But I'm also grateful for the fact that the Soviet Union was not the sole victor. Had Stalin been the sole victor, the whole of Europe would have been turned into a panel colony. The Red Army liberated the survivors of the concentration camps, and we are very thankful for that. Then, these camps were filled with new prisoners. Many of them were innocent, and many of them died. The end of the Hitler era was a liberation. In its aftermath, a new system of repression was built in the Soviet-occupied part of Europe. So that is a quote, and that is, I think, the whole topic over my presentation or keynote address to you. To give you a little history briefing, a short history briefing, because I think for the work today, and especially if we, if we look into the new um, situations we face in the East, we have to know what happened 70 years ago, 50 years ago. What is the, um, the mood in these countries? What do the people think? Is there also, why is there a different thinking in East Germany and in West Germany till today regarding the question of Russia, Ukraine, and so on? So let me start at April 25th, 1945 in Torgau. A situation, we have to think the soldiers, they have fighted thousands of kilometers. They started in the Ural Mountains or deeper in, Sibir in uh, Siberia. They came from America, from Great, Great Britain, and they have lost lots of friends and um, uh, soldier friends from D-Day, from the Normandy, till they arrived at Torgau. And in Torgau and the area around, lots of refugees were there, prisoners of, of war camps, and there were a mass grave with dead bodies of Germans. And so it was a situation where all this crucial and all this violence of the war was in a, in a, like in a concentrated picture. Yeah, they see all the bad things, all this violence happened over the whole war. It was concentrated in this situation in Torgau. And so we declared the so-called spirit of the Elbe. It was a, an idea of the normal soldiers, yeah, not of the generals and the officers, just by the sergeants, you would say, of a simple GIs. And they said, we want to fight that something like that, these crimes happened in the World War II, in the concentration camps, in the front, will never happen again, that we will work for liberty, for freedom, for humanity in the whole world. And this spirit, this oath, was made on April 25th in Torgau. And thousands of kilometers away, in western direction, in the, also in the afternoon in San Francisco, the United Nations were founded with the same idea to work for freedom of the world, 
for cooperation of the states. And that is the bridge I think we have to, we have to take or we have to go from Torgau to San Francisco, in my opinion, and we have to believe that the United Nations were not founded as it came from heaven. It was founded because of the World War II and all these innocent victors, uh, victims uh, they, we have seen. And so then we had the division of Germany. And normally, you know, Torgau, it was occupied first by the West allies, by the Americans. But you know from the conference of Potsdam, the West allies wanted to have parts of Berlin and Stalin wanted to have naja, as much land he can get. Yeah, his idea was to go to the Ruhrgebiet. The Ruhrgebiet is in West Germany, is full of coal and steel, and he wanted to occupy also this area to have new coal and steel for a new war, for example, or for his um, yeah, war industry, put new tanks and so on. And so after the conference of Potsdam, the Soviet zones were built, uh, the occupation zones were built, as you know, it, from the maps, and then a new process started, uh, started especially in, in, East, uh, in East Germany, in the Soviet occupied zone, in the Soviet occupation zone, and later then in the GDR. They wanted to build a new political system, not based on the ideas of democracy and freedom and liberty and justice for all, just on the idea of communism. And the people who didn't want to follow that way, they were op in opposition to it, because there were an idea of freedom, of freedom of speech, freedom of people, they were arrested, like in the times of the Nazis, and like in the so-called NKWD Speziallager, NKWD special camps, so these were special camps, parts of it former concentration camps, former prisons of the Wehrmacht, for example, like in Torga, we had two of these special Soviet uh, camps. And they, the people or the new occupation power wanted to, to change their opinion, yeah? And they wanted to, to change the society with a pressure of violence. And this is something the people had to face a couple of weeks before under, under, or under different power like the Nazi regime. And so we see it with a different, we see it made the aid with very different feelings. It was wonderful and we're very grateful that Hitler was not on power anymore, but it was also not that kind of liberation people, people ask for. My grandma, for example, had to escape from, uh, from today Czech Republic, Sudetenland. May one of you know that. It uh, was part of Germany. She had to escape to our home district and then they, they started to get a new yeah, foundation for life. They got a farmer's land, they were farming people, but everything was regulated. Yeah? The producing of butter, of milk, of meat, yeah? everything was controlled by the occupation power and later the GDR. Yeah? And you know in the GDR economy everything, or in the Soviet, everything was under a rule. Yeah? There was a plan to produce a number of units per food, per good, whatever. And if you produce more, that's okay, but you have to give everything to the power if you produce more, and especially in, the, in times of big need. Yeah, in the beginning of the 50s, the people had food stamps card, for example. Yeah. So they wanted just from their own country, from their own milk, from their own butter, they wanted to have more for their families and for their friends. Yeah. And there, we are in fear of arresting, and so they escaped 1956 from that area to West Germany, from the GDR to West Germany. And so the whole time of the GDR was under pressure. We were controlled partly by the Stasi, Staatssicherheit, so the security police. Yeah? They investigated the whole society with 200,000 people by 70 million, 17 million inhabitants of the GDR. And so it was a big, it was a moment of real freedom and real liberation as the demonstrations from Leipzig, from Berlin, and with the whole GDR ended in the fall of the wall in November 9th. This was the really day for, for me, in my opinion, for my family, 
and for the people in the GDR and later also in the East, Central and Eastern Europe states, this was the day of liberation and the chance of, free of uh, freedom of vote, freedom of speech, freedom of rights were raised and were, yeah, or came, came back or were firstly introduced in that countries. And this is something we have to know every time when we talk about today about United Nations and especially I think the situation in Europe that we had two, three generations who developed in two ways, yeah, or two, speech, uh, two speeds. Yeah, we had the Western Europe, um, we had with kind of Western Europe, uh, no, development, and the Eastern part of development between 1944 and later, 45 and later. And especially of that different developments that we had more Western oriented. And when I speak of Western, I don't mean it in a way, in a geographical way. The Western development or the Western idea of society and of state building is like more of a democratic way, we would say. Yeah? Parliament, freedom of vote, minorities, majorities. Yeah? This is more the Western way, what we mean. And we had this kind of Eastern. We had this, a very big control under the Communist Party, was dictatorships in East Germany and Poland and Czech Republic in the Soviet Union. And, but we also had a more understanding for the people. Yeah? People in GDR were more together with people from Poland, from Czech Republic, because it was not possible to drive to the West. Yeah? And so we have, but also we have an understanding for their cultural, for their thinking. And this is something, or this is something important we have to know today, in my opinion. Then if we see the situation in Ukraine or in Russia, and do we, and if we think, if we try to understand what are the reasons for, what are the reasons for that conflict? Why is there a big Russian-speaking minority in Ukraine, in Latvia, in the Baltic states, and also in uh, in White Russia or in Poland, then you have to take the map of Europe in 1945, and then you have to take the map today, when you see there's a big Western movement. So all the states were changed as states from the West, but you can't change or you can't um, push people to move yeah, from their home towns, from their home districts. They stay, and so the Russians stayed Ukraine or were settled in Ukraine, for example. The Polish people stayed in Ukraine and also in the Baltic states. And this is something we have to understand. And we have to understand that there are big cultural differences between Eastern Europe states and that is not one Eastern Europe, as I think most of, well, not all, especially Western colleagues are from, from the former West Germany yeah, or from the uh, alte Bundesländer, uh, the old states, you would say, in Germany, they have sometimes the idea or I think less information about the situation in Eastern and Central Europe between the line Stettin, this is on the German-Poland, Polish border, and uh, Macedonia, for example, they say, or they think behind this line, Eastern Europe, and this is uh, some cultural area. But there are total differences in speak, uh, in languages, in cultural, and in, uh, in, yeah, in, in, in the way people think about life, think about society. This is one fact we have to learn from, the, from 1945. So the question of when was it a day of liberation, when, when freedom came to everyone, after May the 9th, and uh, after November and the 9th in, in whole Europe. And I think that is something we have to, to take this, this time, uh, this Second World War, to, to know that information, to know that history, to get an idea and be an, or part of a solution, why do we have these conflicts today in Eastern Europe, for example, and why do we sometimes have in, um, in Europe situations where we have 
I would say, um, within the states, uh, you have sometimes minorities, yeah? Südtirol, for example, South Tyrol. Um, and uh, why do we have a situation? Why do we see a conflict, an interstate conflict, and sometimes with an outspread of um, a bigger situation or of whole Europe? And then we come to the question, can we solve this conflict with the United States? Uh, you, not the United States, sorry, especially the United Nations. If you would ask me, in Europe, lots of conflicts were born as a Europe conflict because of the history in Europe. It's not affected uh, in, in the worldwide. Yeah? The Ukraine conflict, I think, affects not the situation in Asia or in Africa or in South America. I don't know, but I'm, it's my opinion it's not. So we, we have to say this is something we have to solve as neighbors, as friends in Europe. And with the United Nations, we have to go more we have to ask the bigger questions. Global warming, for example. This is a real crisis, in my opinion. It's not a war crisis, as we have think, uh, as, as we have started the, the United Nations in 1945. Yeah? This is another kind of crisis we have to face today, so the style and the art of crisis change from the, uh, from the idea that two states go in war over it and the United Nations try to solve it from the new um, I think work the United Nations have to do regarding these new conflicts, the new idea of conflict, terrorism, worldwide global warming. But let me come back to that point in Germany, the situation today. Especially what can we learn, or especially what I want to give you in your idea and in your, or in your, in your way, in your way of studying or for your work, that you understand the Germans maybe a little bit more and especially the question, how is a country today which was so long divided in two parts? Is it affecting also today the opinion, the public opinion? And let me, out, let me say, or give you in fact, where you can see that till today Germany is a little bit divided in two parts. If you look on the political map, and maybe you know the Partei Die Linke, the party they left. This is the former communist party of the GDR, the leading party of the GDR. Then they changed the name into PDS, Die Linke, now today, so Die Linke, the left. In, in Saxony, or in the former GDR, they get results by election between 15 and 20 percent to today. Yeah, last, last, Bundes, uh, last elections, federal elections, they had, in my district, 21 percent. If you look in West, the Linke has just five to six percent. But the Linke in the East is based in their, in their membership structure, based on the former SED people. Yeah? So 80 to 85 percent of the whole Linke were members of the PDS. In West Germany, we have less members uh, in percentage of the whole party. And these people are more for communists, uh, where really dream for a new communist state, for a socialist idea. And these people are the so-called West German communists, where they are not thinking the same idea of an East German communist, for example. So we have a political break or division of Germany till today, if you see the results. You see it also, the social democrats in Germany, in West Germany, they get less and less results than in West Germany. Next, we have a big division of economy. We have less economic growth in East, and we have uh, less, in, less in economic growth in East than in the West. And especially in the 90s, and this is the biggest outspread, and this is some things I would say, this is the second reputation the East Germans had to pay. The first reputation, re, 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 reparation, not reputation, reparation, also reparationen, these Germans had to pay the whole reparations to the Soviet army after 1945. Factories where they, we had to deliver factories, food, goods, uh, also railroad tracks, yeah, machine, and all that, and lots of money to the Soviet Union. West Germany, didn't have to do it, 
because the Americans and the French people, they were smart enough to say, okay, if we take all their economy, all the factories, all the infrastructure, all the money, they can't, we can't have an economic development. Yeah, on what kind of basis? And it is better to develop a society, an economy, that the people can live on their own than to be dependent the whole time from ourselves, from our occupation powers. And it was not just the, the material things the East Germans had to pay for as a reparation, money and good and factories and so on, especially the fact I described before with the concentration, with the new Soviet camps, that people were, were killed systematically in the, in the Soviet uh, boot camp. Uh, I would not say concentration camps, it's special, special, special prison camps. Yeah? They're arrested for nothing, for just to be, have another opinion. They got no food. Yeah? They hadn't the chance to go to a doctor. So at the end, it was a system, so the Soviet occupation power in VGR, they were fine with the idea. If they die in, in our camps because of no water, no, no food, and no possibility or no access to medicine, then we accept it. And my grand-grandfather died also in 1948 in a Soviet concentration camps by tuberculosis. Tuberculosis? Yes. Yeah, tuberculosis. And this was the real reparation the people had to pay. They paid the reparation with their lives. And the second reparation after, um, after the fall of the wall was we had these different economic situations. In the West was a very well-growing Western economic. And there was this, an, an phrase by the, by the people in the, in the East. They said, if we demark, so the German mark, will not come to us, we go to, to, to there, we go to the German market, so we take us. And because the economic situation was so totally different, but after the fall of the wall, there, lots of young people decided to go to the West because there was a very high number of unemployment because the factories there in the GDR were around, not on the standard of 1990s, as the fall of the wall where we were on the, on the level of 1950, 1916. Yeah, so they had no chance in the international and global world to get a good price for their products. We're not, we're, we're not wettbewerbsfähig. Yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't yeah, we couldn't participate in that economical world. And so we paid with our young people, with our well-educated people from the 90s. Yeah, they studied, they learned a lot in, in good schools in Saxony, for example, and then they, and they go. And this demographic change, yeah, this is some things we, we feel now. We feel a higher number of elder people percentage in the especially rural areas of Eastern Germany. We had to close lots of schools. Um, and we are now looking for new, um, oh God, Fachkräfte. Uh, staff. staff, yeah, for new educated staff. Yeah, because there is no one. We have a situation right now from the last year. We have one student who graduated from school with 1.6 open jobs, so job offers. So we have more job offers when we have students. Yeah? And this is a situation that will come maybe a little bit more and more critic. Of course, if you have less people, you have less future because the new contribution, contribution payers for the social, for the social uh, system we have in Germany with our pension money, with our uh, medicine system, yeah, it, it, it's just working because we have now young people or families who are working and paying contribution in the system and that, that at the same money, from the same money, the payments for the pensionary are paid or the costs for medicine. And especially elderly people, they need more money for medicine and for pension. And if you have less younger people who are paying in the system and more people getting money from the system, then you have a really big problem. And that's the situation we have to face now. And so especially the West got, yeah, I would not say they get, 
it was by their own decision of the people to move to the West because of the high number of unemployment, got all this brain, and in the end, uh, this brain drain is till today a real big problem we have to face just because of the division of Germany 70 years ago. And just let me check if I not, okay. Um, and this is something I wanna give you as an idea how history affect our, our demographic change, our life till today in Europe, uh, also especially in Germany. And that is why we have to work for the possibilities of, of freedom, that we work, that the people can live in a freedom world, in a free world, where they can be open to develop their self in the, on the place they want to live, especially on the home country. I think we have also a brain drain now in Europe, from Italy, Spain, within Italy, from the South Italy to North Italy, and from Spain to Germany or from Italy to Germany, we have big Italian communities. The people do not come because it's so nice in Berlin. The weather, I think, is, is less nice in Berlin than in Rome or in Napoli. We just came to, to earn money. We had to get a job here, to find a job, because the situation, especially in South Italy and Spain, isn't that well. But in the end, these regions, they lose their best capital they have. The intelligence of the young people, their families, then in the end, most of the young people are getting children and can get a new generation. And these, gen in these areas, they lose future. Yeah? And this is something that is why we have to work in a freedom way together, in a way of freedom in Europe together, that we have to identify areas which are in a crisis, which need our support, our solidarity, not just an automatic, it's not an automatic solidarity I'm arguing for, like the left ones. I'm working for self-response solidarity, I'm arguing. Um, and then this is what we have learned from society, from the history, what can happen when, and these are my, my last ideas, um, this is when, we, when we not work together, when we let situations, when we allow situations like we had 70 years ago, yeah, and that, coming back to the quote, that would happen if all the Soviet power would, would have been rule a Europe. Yeah. So these are a couple of my thoughts regarding that, that keynote and that topic. And I thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I didn't bring you too much into a fear and didn't describe the situation too hard. But this is something we have to face today. And I'm really looking forward maybe to your ideas, to your thoughts, and to get to know you as the young people as we are. And I think, yeah, we are one generation. I mean, I'm 29 years old, so not that old. Uh, so what we can develop our future together as partners and friends, wherever you are living and working. And yeah, so thank you very much. And yeah, it's yours.